you know, because I want to... Hi, and welcome to the edition of Ruins of Empire, which is host Rafael Pinero. Tonight, we're going to be talking about uh, what is and is in a video game. And as an example, I'm going to be using the Stanley Parable. First of all, before we get into the, the meat of the argument and the uh, discussion tonight, I'm going to make a bold statement. And that bold statement is that the Stanley Parable is not a game. The second part of that statement is that that is a good thing. So to recap, the Stanley Parable uh, created in, on, and released on July 2011 on Steam and made with the Source Engine is not a game. And that is a good thing. So what is the Stanley Parable? Well, the Stanley Parable is what you might call a form of interactive fiction or interactive storytelling. Now, wait a minute. You're saying, oh, 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 uh, uh, storytelling? Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Storytelling in a video game? Didn't you make and post a video about, yeah, you can't have storytelling in a video game because I'm so, 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 so. Like, like I said, the Stanley Parable is not a video game. Ergo, you can't have storytelling because it's not a video game. Because the thing is that in interactive fiction, and the Stanley Parable is a perfect example of this, it's all about the story and delivering that story to an audience. And the Stanley Parable does it very well. The first thing in the, that it does is, in fact, illustrate and mock the idea of the illusion of control. Uh, in the Stanley Parable, you, well, the audience sees and experiencing, experiences things through Stanley, a office drone who literally wakes up one day, presumably one morning, and realizes that A, he's getting no order through his computer, he has literally nothing to do, and B, everyone in his office has disappeared. Oh, and C, he now has a narrator either stuck in his head or he's hearing it some coming in his voice uh, from somewhere in the ether. We can draw a lot of conjectures about that, of whether Stanley is or is not insane, and this is real, this is meant, this is, you know, uh, fourth wall breaking stuff, what have you, but that's the situation. And as an audience member, usually as a player, you take control of Stanley. However, there's not a lot of things that Stanley can do, mechanically speaking. Stanley can, the player through Stanley can walk, and can interact with some objects, buttons, the odd can, or computer screen, or what have you, and that's it. Furthermore, as they progress through the environment, they're met with several choices. And if they, like most players in a video game, try to follow what the video game uh, tells them is the path to success, they find themselves committing a series of very simple actions that resolve themselves very quickly, in an interesting but rather linear and predictable storyline. They meet the end, and then they start back at zero. But if they choose not to follow what the narrator is telling them, then they enter this own county valley territory in which the narrator, and through the narrator the, the product, tries to rearrange and rewrite the story to fit whatever the audience decides Stanley is doing any moment. So if you, instead of going left, you go right, the, the narrator will go, well, you know, he meant to go this way, but no, 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 he's going to find his way back, etc., etc. And sometimes he would plead with uh, Stanley, other times he will mock Stanley. Again, the line where Stanley begins and the audience member ends is very thin and deliberately so. But the fact that you can, as an audience member, go left or right, jump here and there, press a button or not, gives a sense of, of control, that they are in control. But the fact that no matter what they do, it all falls into this greater plan and, and it's being anticipated by the narrator and therefore the designers of the product means that they never actually had any control. Ergo, the illusion of control. Furthermore, the minimal controls available to you, the fact that, you know, there are no guns, and there are no, um, you know, you, you don't have even a jump button, to be honest. And then many situations end up in, you know, in dead ends, seemingly dead ends, 
really reflects more the illusion of participation. That is, they are a story or series of stories set up before you, and you can either follow them or not, right? The, uh, the controls are there to sort of allow the audience to engage with the Stanley Parable rather than to play it. In fact, had it been a game, it would be more can you know the title would be different. It would be something like the Stanley parody, or the Stanley paradox, and not saying the Stanley parable, which means it's a form of story, with perhaps a lesson attached to it. Kind of like well, you know, Christian parable, or other forms of religious parables found in, in many a holy text. Examples of a story with a often heavy message, and here the message is. The illusion of control is very much an illusion. And because of the limited uh, control scheme, is the player agency so reduced. In fact, any of the choices are just choices that are presented to you almost most of the time in a binary sequence. Go here, go there. Go left, go right, go up, go down. To the point that you realize that every single choice available to you is in fact an illusion. And you simply are going through the motions, right? And you go the uh, the amount of player agency is reduced to such a point that it stops being uh, the illusion of control once you realize what's going on and you feel more like you're simply participating in Stanley's story. You're not playing the Stanley parable, you're merely participating in it, right? Uh, whether you follow the instructions of the, uh, of the narrator or don't at any given moment. And I find that very fascinating because the Stanley Parable is, is because it's so story-centric and is, in fact, trying to deliver a narrative. It's a perfect example of, like I said before, um, interactive fiction. You are there to see what's going on to Stanley. It's all about Stanley. It's all about the narrator. It's all about the, in, the virtual space and what happens there. There are really no actual goals for you to accomplish as a player, if you were to be a player. There are no real challenges. In fact, if you follow the instructions of the narrator, uh, you just, you know, you press buttons and we think, oh, this is going to be a puzzle here, you know. No, the answer is given to you. There is no challenge. Even things that appear to be failure states are not. You cannot fail the Stanley Parable. Because it's not about the players, it's not about, uh, you know, the player doesn't learn new skills, doesn't master uh, navigation or combat or any maneuvers or, you know, skill trees or any of that. Uh, or conversation trees or, the, you know, uh, finding clues. None of that is available. It's just about Stanley. And I will even go further in saying that, and this is one that makes not only the Stanley Parable, but well-crafted uh, interactive fiction that the controls are not only there to sort of hook you in and, and sort of give a sense of participation that will keep you, keep the, the uh, story flowing, thus enhancing uh, the situation, if you will, beyond just watching what happens, just beyond watching a movie about Stanley just moving around done in the source engine, right? Those controls, as minimal as they are, allow you to explore all the possibilities of the Stanley Parable. It's, it's as if you were walking through not only a movie, but also a movie with all the possible, all the cut scenes, you know, all the, the director's cut, right? Like, oh, this scene was meant for Stanley to jump into a hole. But we cut that and instead there is no hole and Stanley just walked through there, right? In the Stanley Parable, you can explore what happens if Stanley jumps into the hole versus what happens when he doesn't, right? Another form of looking at it is like taking the, you know, a, a, a television series and, and then taking the full pack of uh, fan fiction written by, by his fans um, in DeviantArt or Tumblr, whatever, and saying, okay, I'm going to take the television series, and then I'm going to add to it all the fan fiction, all the possible interpretations attached to it by the audience. It's a great way of exploring the larger narrative space created by, uh, well, the creators of the Stanley Parable. 
something you can really do in passive media, nor in a video game. Although video games often give you branching options, they're really more, in a, and they're this sort of design, again, within the framework of the illusion of control and within the aspect of uh, player agency, uh, as, okay, do you want to be the conqueror of the galaxy or the savior of the galaxy? And often they're binary, basically two, 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 two sides of the same coin. You still have to sort of fight villains, turn in quests, do all the things that the game demands you because the focus is winning, right? The focus is conquering the game, winning the game. Uh, and everything in the game is supposed to reflect your past actions and express in some way or another, right? Um, and it has to feel like that is a choice you make as a player, that you are in control. But in interactive fiction, it's not about the player. It's about, in this case, Stanley or any other character or a cast of characters, right? They're doing their thing, more or less. You just allow to not only observe what they're doing, but also explore all the possibilities that those actions can create within sort of the framework of the larger narrative, right? So you have Stanley's basic story, which is when you follow the narrator, and what will happen if Stanley literally takes the door to the right and goes somewhere else, and then it's like, well, oh, well, oh, well, the then Stanley didn't go here, so let's see what Stanley does over there, and you follow the story. Even when you think you have failed, you haven't, because there's a possibility. That is always a possibility that the Stanley could make, quote-unquote, the wrong choice. You know, it's like saying, oh, the Stanley died. In, in a video game, that would be considered a failure. You die. Game over. You start at the last save point, whatever, or start from the beginning and go at it. But in the Stanley Parable, and in fact in interactive fiction, that is not a failure. It's just another possibility. That is a story that ended that way. Like in a real novel, you can have a situation where the hero dies at the end. It's such in a movie, right? But in interactive fiction, you have both possibilities included in the same narrative space. Wherein in a book or a movie, usually, uh, since the nature of, of it is that it's linear and non-interactive, you only get to see what is presented to you at the end of the story. Either the hero lives or they die. Or they hang in a lampshade and question like, well, maybe they're dead or not, whatever. But that can happen. Now, whether it's a good story, if that makes for a good ending or not, that's a different subject. But it is the ending as expressed, as written, as shown, as recorded. In interactive fiction, if you have the proper tools to explore the interactive environment, the narrative space, um, both endings, as well as any other ending, is equally valid, right? Because it's all about the possibilities and exploring those possibilities, which I think makes, because you do have an interactive element, makes interactive fiction stand out and stand aside from passive media uh, used for storytelling. And that's the thing, that the focus of interactive fiction is the fiction. If the focus of video games is the game, then the focus of interacting fiction is the fiction. Story comes first. And not simply story, but storytelling. A good piece of interactive fiction has to be able to properly de deliver the story and match the story with uh, good interactive elements, usually minimal interactive elements. A few QTs here and there, uh, you know, bottom prompts. Um, a way of maneuvering the space and interacting with certain objects and stuff like that, right? They may have just one central mechanic and that's it. Um, but since it's all about the story and the story or the possibilities of the story, there are no failure states. Uh, you don't lose. But also, you don't win. You just experience what happens. You see what happens. You explore what happens. And I think that is a, a great thing uh, that makes uh, interactive fiction stand out. But as you know, I usually, when I make these videos, I make a lot of uh, controversial statements. And I'm going to make more controversial statements. Because the thing is that the Stanley Parable is not unique. In fact, I would say that one of the problems that we have, and one of the reasons why people are trying to shoehorn storytelling in video games, is that nobody has really recognized, especially the critics, but even the audiences, the fact that 
interactive fiction has always been with us. But it's always in, been seen as sort of a property of, of games and gaming. Ergo, often what we've seen is that there's an attempt to restrict or uh, interactive fiction and put it in the mold of video game. Um, and there have been many types of interactive fiction that have sort of been hobbled, if you will. They have been... Uh, uh, it's very difficult to put into words here because this is sort of new territory. They have been, um, I would even say, crippled by the need to make them or to turn them into games when they're not. Uh, the old text adventures, uh, the old point-and-click adventures, even the so-called visual novels, they all have gamey things in them. Like, you know, puzzles that, are, that follow this insane troll creator logic, right? It's like, oh, it basically boils down to rub object A on area B, right? See if you can tell one pixel from the next where the actual button is as opposed to just a piece of wall. That kind of thing. Um, why? Because there needs to be a challenge, right? And there has to be success and failure states because that's what video games demand. Uh, also forced uh, arcade sequences because, again, you know, video games have to have action and they have to have combat and... You know, they don't really have to. Not all videos have to have to do that. But there's a, there's a sense that you have to have that. that, And therefore, in your game, you're going to have a, a forced RK sequence. You know, somebody shooting or you're avoiding rocks or, or a platform sequence all of a sudden. Um, because that's what video games are all about, right? And you have to have some kind of challenge. Ergo, if this piece of interactive fiction is not interactive fiction, but a video game, it has to have a video gamey element to it, right? Uh, even though if you look at interactive fiction, there's always been there, um, the focus is on the story. The focus is on delivering the story. Uh, mechanics are, uh, are minimal. They're just there, and there's enough mechanics there to allow you to uh, in interact with and engage with the narrative. In the best one. And I, I, would, I would go so far, and this is when a lot of people are going to get angry at me, to put uh, the stuff that the the Telltale uh, games are doing. If you've seen the Telltale uh, products, and we'll call them games, that's a controversial part, uh, you've seen that they have been cutting down on the uh, game mechanics, right? The puzzles are gone. Now it's all, it's all about QTEs, button prompts, and dialogue options. I would even say that you can get rid of the QTEs and just have the dialogue option. And if you think about it, those dialogue options, for the most part, are uh, ways to explore the narrative. If I say this, then somebody's going to say that. If I don't say something, then that's the same thing. If I make this decision, then you know this character could you know cut and run, or try to be faithful, or do this, or do that, right? And but that's it, right? They're, it, they're interactive fiction. Interactive fiction has been there from the very beginning. But it has been saddled with a lot of baggage from being video games. All the reasons why people, you know, critics, for example, insist that the interactive fiction has to be video games because otherwise it would be beyond the reach of, of, their, um, of their criticism. Uh, James Sterling, one of the last uh, videos he made for The Escapist, uh, talked about that, and I will put a link to it. In, in the description below, and I also put it, a link to uh, my rebuttal in my blog. And also, I think people want, who are game designers by uh, by uh, definition say, you know what, oh, this has to be a video game because otherwise I find myself, you know, my product gets discredited otherwise. And so do a lot of players. If And that's when people, that's controversial. It's like, oh, no, I, I remember playing King Quest and Space Quest and... Uh, Leisure Suit Larry and um, Day of the Tentacle and, you know, Monkey Island and all that. Oh, those were great games. They're, my childhood was wrapped into spending, spending hundreds of hours in front of my Commodore 64 or my, you know, I, you know IBM PC XT or my 286 or 486 or 386 or whatever, you know, uh, whiling the hours away, you know, uh, doing this thing. So clearly these are games because when I played them. I played them and they were games. And you cannot tell me they're not games because you cannot tell me that what I experienced was less than. 
listen, I'm not doing that. Even if I could, which I can't, I'm not. To those people who feel that making the distinction between a video game and interactive fiction devalues a lot of great pieces of interactive fiction, I would say, again, it's time that we take a giant step back and look at the whole field of electronic or virtual interactive entertainment. And I'm throwing words out there because I'm trying to find the right language for this. Kind of virgin territory in a way, right? Uh, and say, you know what? For the longest of times, the longest time, I should say, video games have dominated this space. It was a video games or nothing, right? Maybe a, a board game or two which has a couple of buttons and sounds and stuff like that, which had an electronic aspect to it, or a DVD that sort of had a little game in it. It's like, well, again, it has an interactive element to otherwise passive media. But interactive fiction simply got folded into video games and ignored, basically. Oh, these are games. Often ignored with the fact that, oh, these are poor games. Because that's another aspect of this. It's like, this sounds very much like the argument that Mr. Sterling makes in his video. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, what you're saying is essentially this is not a video game, right? A, a very good way of dismissing these products as being lesser than. But like I said in the beginning, the Stanley Parable is not a video game. And that's a good thing. I think it's time we embrace the fact that there's more to this than just video games. We take a giant step back and look at this large chunk of the space we're talking about dominated by video games, but we also realize that there's spaces for other things as well, including interactive fiction, including uh, virtual art installations. Um, they offer different things, but using the same tools and even having some of the same roots as video games. It's like talking, you know, po po uh, prose versus uh, verse, right? Poetry is poetry. Uh, uh, prose fiction is prose fiction. Right? A novel is not a can have a poem in it, but it's not poetry for the most part. You can't, they're different. They're part of a much larger structure of literature, right? Uh, but they are significantly different than we say, oh yeah, well, this is poetry and this is, you know, prose fiction. This is a novel, a novella, a short story, etc. Right? Doesn't diminish one from the other. I may prefer to read novels instead of poetry, but it doesn't make poetry less than novels or vice versa. Just like if I may or may not prefer interactive fiction, uh, that doesn't make it less than video games. It also doesn't uh, make them, uh, doesn't free them from criticisms. You can have bad interactive fiction. And in fact, I, su I suspect that many a walking simulator is in fact badly created interactive fiction because it failed to engage the audience, to get them engaged. It didn't have the proper mechanics at the proper time didn't use them to engage the audience in such a way that they became interested in what was going on and became interested in exploring the narrative space that I keep talking about, right? Seeing the possibilities of this greater story, right? The meta story as opposed to just a very linear story in a movie or a television show, etc., right? Uh, not only see the main storyline, but also all the what ifs, right? And to experience a product that doesn't constantly demand your success, uh, you constantly demand your attention, um, a product that works at a different tempo. And for all those reasons, I believe it's time that we recognize that interactive fiction is a thing and that we embrace interactive fiction as its own thing. It would be much better for video games as well as for interactive fiction. Interactive fiction would be freed from the impositions of video games, and I think designers will stop trying to storytell in video games. And instead, as the past video showed, use uh, story elements or story to enhance their video games, but make sure that first and foremost, the video game comes first. So what are the lessons to be learned from this? Well, first of all, if you experience the Stanley Parable, and I suggest not only experience the demo, which is free on Steam, as well as the main product. In fact, the main product kind of makes more sense if you play the demo, well, or experience the demo. Um, you will find an excellent, or two excellent pieces of, in, of interactive entertainment, interactive fiction. 
acknowledging that the Stanley Parable is interactive fiction and not a game also means that you tend you tend to recognize this, that's the second lesson that there is in fact space for interactive fiction once you recognize there's a space for interactive fiction the third lesson is that just because something falls in the category of interactive fiction doesn't make it less than or immune to effective criticism it just has to be analyzed on its own merits fourth lesson is if you want an ex a great example of what I call the illusion of control and uh, the idea of player agency Stanley Parable is a great place to start and finally and this is where Mr. Sterling and I agree both in my comments I made to the video originally in the escapist as well as uh, in my uh, column we should not use the term it's not a game right to dismiss products, uh, either games that we don't like or products that are game-like but are not games, as being lesser than quote-unquote true video games. Well, that's all for me for tonight. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. I'll have more videos ready for you soon, probably starting tomorrow. And I'll see you when I see you. Good night.